Welcome to Shelter and Solidarity, a deep dive with artists and activists during this COVID pandemic. I'm your host, Joe Ramsey, joined by my co-host, Linda Liu. There she is. Let's try that again. Joined by your host, Joe Ramsey. And Linda Liu. For the first time, co-hosting truly together here from Dorchester, Massachusetts on the south side of Boston. Now beyond five months into this shelter in place. Before we begin with our theme for today, a word about how far we've come. Today is August 20th, 2020, 8 20 2020, and this, in fact, is our 20th weekly episode of Shelter and Solidarity. Uh, it's been quite a wild ride, and we are here going strong in our 20th episode, and I think we have a great theme for today. Thank you to all who are joining us live here on Zoom, on Facebook, and who will be watching soon on YouTube. Our theme for today is transformative change, question mark, how can the left win elections in the United States and beyond? We are very privileged to have with us a scholar activist who has written on this topic in a very profound way, uh, as well as a uh, respondent and a discussant from our own production team who will be helping to lead the discussion once we begin. Uh, we have John Lawrence and we have Seren Mudliar, and uh, Linda's going to tell us a little bit more about John. Okay, so John Lawrence teaches psychology at the College of Staten Island, City University of New York. He serves as the grievance counselor at CSI for the Professional Staff Congress, the union that represents faculty and staff at CUNY. He is active in his local chapter of Peace Action and volunteered in the Bernie Sanders campaign. Thank you, John, for being here. Are you there? Can yes. we hear you? Yes, Just making sure. Me? Here in Zoom world, of course, we only uh, see you when we hear you. John will be led in discussion by Seren Mudliar, who many of you know. Seren is not only a co-producer of Shelter and Solidarity, often behind the cameras helping to make things happen, but he is the managing editor of of the journal Socialism and Democracy, as well as a contributing editor and the editor of a recent book volume, very relevant today's discussion on turnout. I don't have the subtitle in front of me. I'm sure Seren can, uh, can pr produce it for us in a moment, but a very relevant book on turnout from a left perspective. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that Seren is the co-author with Joseph Nevins and Eleni McCrackis of A People's Guide to Greater Boston, a book that I, uh, I'm looking forward to teaching this fall and I recommend to you all. Stren, thanks for stepping onto this side of the camera once again. Hi Joe, thanks for uh, sort of that nice introduction and for letting me frame this conversation. It's, I take a particular pleasure in doing so. Uh, as, as the managing editor of Socialism and Democracy, I've received a number of papers which come across my desk and I have to make a decision about them. Is, does this meet the standard of our journal? Does it uh, qualify as something that would not only be of interest to our uh, readers, but also doesn't sort of meet the minimum standards uh, of publication before forwarding it on to our editorial board for review. And this was a paper that I read and immediately knew that I was very interested in it. I, I really uh, sort of uh, was drawn into the paper you know, about, about certain things that were very specific to it. And I'll say a little bit about it before uh, putting a question to John. But uh, why, why was I drawn to this paper? Well, we've received many papers that, that speak to our mission as a journal of strategy and a journal for socialists, right? But often these tend to, more often than not, these tend to be historical papers, right? They are papers about strategy as it pertains to, say, the German Revolution or the Bienio Rosso, right? But, but very few that speak to the current political moment. And this was one of the first that spoke to the current political moment. And then it did something that, that scholars and activists well, that scholars tend to shrink from. It, it began to sort of speculate and suggest what we could be doing, right? And so 
this also spoke to me as something very necessary, and I shared it with the rest of the board quite soon thereafter. And there was also a lot of excitement and enthusiasm about the paper then, right? Which isn't to say that the paper sort of met with universal acclaim, and so I'd like to get into some of those conversations right away. Okay. Um, Absolutely. Seren, if I could just jump in. I read this paper. I only had a chance uh, to read it before the show. And I was really, Lin Linda and I both were very taken with it. I think it's certainly very timely in ways that we'll explore today. Uh, that, that paper, again, we just posted it in the chat box uh, for those who are on the Zoom live, but it's called Organizing the Democratic Capacity for Transformative Change, the 2020 Election and Beyond. And I was really impressed by the way it brings together, you know, nuts and bolts discussion of how elections could be won uh, and, you know, the, the nitty gritty from fundraising to, you know, get out the vote. But while maintaining a bold, robust, kind of inspiring working class transformative vision. And those are two things I don't often feel come together. You know, you have big picture transformative change and you have pragmatic nuts discussion of you know, what can be done on this campaign. And I don't often see those two fused. So yeah, I mean, again, I'm just echoing your point. I think it's a really inspiring article. I know maybe Linda wants to say something about it too, was, was quite impressed by it. Yes, I, I was also very impressed um, by so many parts of your work, John. Um, and there are so many, so I'm just going to actually um, describe a few that really stood out to me. Um, so I, for one, have been pretty distant from electoral politics for, uh, for quite a while. And this is probably because I never, I never felt that um, that realm see really related to people's everyday struggles. It seemed, it seemed very separate. Um, and I never felt that genuinely excited about electoral politics until Bernie Sanders campaigns in 2016 and 2020. Uh, but after Sanders' disappointing defeats both times, I wasn't sure that his progressive agenda would ever be able to be really implemented from inside the um, Democratic Party establishment. Uh, but John, you make a convincing case for the need for a um, working people's caucus, I think that's what you call it, um, within the Democratic Party, which would serve as a kind of institutional home that is enduring and disciplined and helps to coordinate the multiple grassroots movements and groups organized around specific interests. And uh, you say that without this institutional home, these fragmented groups and movements may not have the capacity to scale up to a level where they can win power away from the establishment political parties. So, and then you, you delve really into the nitty gritty of how to, to scale up this capacity um, in a way that seems viable and in a way that's inspiring to, um, to working people. And so this is not something that I've really heard or um, seen uh, discussed or analyzed rigorously uh, very many places. So, um, so I'm really excited to, um, to have you here today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, I think we both, we really, uh, we look forward to discussing this with you today. And I'm gonna kick it to Seren uh, after just one additional point of endorsement for those who haven't read. It's a longer article, so I think it needs a little, you know, plug. Um, you really attend to both the possibility and the need for this united working class transformative movement while also not, you know, avoiding the real messy trickiness of, of dealing with a much, a very fragmented left and not just a fragmented left, but a fragmented society that is then reflected in that left in terms of the forms and, and issues of struggle. And I think, you know, you provide a framework that really needs to be engaged with. I know there's a lot of people out there who are skeptical of electoral politics, a lot of people who, who think it's, you know, it's, it's a lesser evil and that's it, you know, uh, what a uh, damage control and nothing more than that, or you know, risk. What, what do we? What do we, what do we say? Harm reduction. But uh, I'm going to get out of the way and let and let Seren and you go at it for a while, and Linda and I will be here to support and jump in from time to time. And again, for those of us who those who are online live with us, in about an hour, maybe a little less, we will open it up to your questions and comments. And if you would like to indicate that you have one to share, please write it in the chat box, and we will call on you to deliver it yourself. Or if you don't have audio, we will deliver it for you. All right. 
We're getting out of the way. Seren, John, take it away. So John, obviously you have a very um, sympathetic and friendly audience here, including the two hosts and your respondent who are gushing with enthusiasm for the paper. I should also let people know that we shared in the chat a summary of the paper that you provided. So why don't you lay out your argument for us? Um, people can refer to the summary for sure, but tell us about the situation that you were responding to when you wrote this paper. Sure. Uh, I know that a lot of that people on the activist left are very disappointed that Sanders did not, is not our, uh, uh, you know, not the presidential candidate right now. And, and so some people are so despondent that they're, you know, considering even like boycotting this election or, uh, however, uh, I want to argue that, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been just really a, a pretty incredible resurgence of left activism, both movement activism and electoral activism. And, and uh, the Sanders campaign like came out of nowhere and, uh, you know, vied, you know, had a, somebody who called himself uh, a uh, democratic socialist to, you know, vying for the presidential candidacy of the United States, something that was, I would never even have imagined like, like uh, five years ago. And uh, in addition, you know, we've had a number of incredible new left candidates being elected to uh, Congress. Uh, you know, we had the squad and then we just had recent victories of uh, Jamal B Bauman and uh, Corey Bush. And I know up in uh, Massachusetts, you have an exciting candidate in uh, Alex Morris that's coming up in, in a couple of weeks. And so, you know, we've had these incredible successes also. Uh, and I think that this lays the, the groundwork for, you know, building and uh, the goal of, of working class politics is Basically, we want to contest for power. We, we basically want to be able to take power from the capitalists and, and uh, you know, it, have our platform put in, you know, made into policy and executed. And so it, it's going to take both movement politics and, uh, and electoral politics to get there. And, and I think we can build on these successes uh, to, to move forward. Um, my paper, I was, so my, when, I, when I was thinking about writing my paper, I was basically thinking, well, what exactly does the left need to do to build the capacity to really contest for power with the capitalist class in the United States? And in other you know, countries in, in the world, in, where that's been done, it's got been done through a working class party or a labor or socialist party. And, and uh, in the United States, we've never had a national labor or socialist party that's been able to contest for power. And a big reason why we have not is that we have this two party system that makes it incredibly difficult for a third party to form and to compete. It, um, and kind of a catalyst or a starting point from, from my article is I read this really interesting article in Jacobin by uh, Seth Ackerman entitled A Blueprint for a New Party. And in that uh, article, you know, he uh, kind of briefly goes over this history in which we've uh, had these uh, attempts at third parties in the United States and they've been repetitively unsuccessful. And on the other hand, the other big strategy that's been uh, tried is trying to like uh, organize from within the Democratic Party and organize kind of a progressive left in the Democratic Party. Uh, but even that, or like the most recent famous organizing was done by in the Jackson campaigns in the late 80s and, uh, uh, you know, with the organizing only happened around a presidential campaign. It wasn't, it wasn't sustained. 
Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ackerman basically argues that both these strategies just aren't working. And he also argues that uh, our electoral system in the United States is designed to, you know, keep the capitalist class in power by having, by limited to these two parties and they basically play like a good cop, bad cop role. And, and uh, because we're uh, caught between these choices, uh, a lot of people just become alienated from the electoral system and just drop out because they figured their votes have no influence on, on the election. So he basically argues that another strategy would be to organize an independent uh, uh, party-like structure that could make uh, strategic choices about running candidates inside the Democratic Party or outside the Democratic Party or, or on its own line. That, you know, wedding ourselves to running as a third party or wedding ourselves to running in the Democratic Party uh, is, is limiting our options. And he also emphasized the importance that we need to, that this, what would makes it different than previous attempts to work inside the Democratic Party is he emphasizes the importance of, of uh, organizing an institution, you know, an institution in which the working class can come together and make, uh, you know, deliberate about its priorities, uh, make strategic plans to reach those priorities, and then then work together to get them. And that, and that this uh, uh, basically a proto party would be able to organize both in context of electoral politics and movement politics and, and uh, develop basically a working class, help people develop a working class political identity in, in which people can identi identify with and embrace uh, a working class uh, politic. Um, uh, and so, in, basically, I, I was thinking that in a, in, a, in a way, the Sanders movement and what's happened since that time is that started to develop uh, something along these lines. So the Sanders campaign came along and he made a strategic choice not to run as a third candidate, third party candidate. He chose to run in the Democratic Party. And I think that uh, that made his, his campaign seem particularly viable to working people and that it, there was like a clear path to victory that it, it basically, and it seems like a strategic path. So the, you know, that he could take on the democratic establishment in the context of our primary. And then if he wins that, take on the Republican establishment in the context of a general election. And so it, it, in addition, it didn't, uh, it ruled out the possibility that he would act as a spoiler. So uh, because his strategy seemed viable and he had a very exciting platform that energized people that was headlined with, uh, um, Medicare for all, uh, a uh, Green New Deal, and, and eliminating student debt and making uh, quality education from preschool through uh, your doctoral degree free for everybody, that this energized people and excited people and, and uh, lots of people got involved. So it seemed like a viable strategy. And, and then they created an organization where lots of people could just step in and become part of, of uh, organizing for the, uh, for the campaign. So you literally had several million people getting involved in the Sanders campaign and, and also uh, millions of people donating to it. So in 2016, he had over 7 million individual donations and he raised, I think around 250, million dollars and he did the same thing again this time so that that's very exciting and and, and made his uh campaign seem viable so in in um my paper i basically ask well 
how can we turn this in, this, this campaign strategy that just comes together in this campaign, how can we institutionalize that? What would we need, we need to make that into uh, basically a permanent uh, proto-party? And I called it uh, a working Democratic, Democrats ca caucus, uh, a working Democrats caucus that would mostly work inside the Democratic Party, would, but would be independent from the Democratic Party and, and uh, uh, run candidates to, um, with, with uh, this progressive platform and, and, also, and create the, the um, skills and the, and the uh, capacity for supporting people. And so and then you see organizations that come together that are adapting some of this, of this strategy already. So you have like, uh, for example, you have the Our Revolution and you have Justice Democrats and you have uh, Democratic Socialists uh, of America, the DSA, and you have the Working Families Party. And in, in, all, in all these organizations in part are, are already starting to uh, institutionalize and, and put into practice some of this you know, larger strategy of uh, supporting candidates, uh, training candidates, helping them fundraise, and, and uh, creating an infrastructure to support uh, a, a progressive working class uh, uh, politics in, in, in electoral form in the United States. John, you know, I'd like to explore the Working Democrats uh, caucus idea a little bit more. First, though, I want to underline a point that you made. The working class needs to see a clear path to victory in order to be energized and invest in a particular course of action. That, that seems to be something that, that you think is absolutely necessary. By implication, then, the lack of support for, say, third party efforts, and I, I want to get back to that issue a little bit later, um, is, uh, is related to the fact that people don't really see a clear path to victory um, uh, with these other third party efforts. Uh, before we, we get to that though, I'd like to consider the 1988 Jackson campaign and the, 26, the outcome of the 2016 uh, Sanders campaign. In, in 1988, Jackson ran an insurgent campaign. He ran as an outsider. And the fruit of that big, of that uh, uh, that large percentage of the vote that he got, right, um, before ultimately losing, was that he got to name the chair of the DNC, right, Ron Brown, and Ron Brown would go on to help the Clintons in completely remaking the Democratic Party, removing the um, legacy of whatever remained of the New Deal at that point. They helped exercise it. Uh, now, nothing like that occurred in 2016 when Sanders won, right? He, he did impact the platform a little bit. Um, however, it seems to me that there was no sort of insight or control from the, Demo from the working class base in terms of how Sanders would relate to the, to the leadership of the Democrats. You know, today's the day, the last day of the Democratic Convention, and they've uh, also uh, convened conversations about their platforms. Sanders got to name a platform negotiating team, which included famously AOC, but there was no connective tissue between the working class base that propelled Sanders to that position and the, um, and the actual negotiations that happened over the platform. Do you see the various uh, groups that you've named, the Justice Democrats um, and various other ones, as sort of standing in for the Working Democrats caucus that you imagine? Do you see them as either forerunners or constituents of a future work, work, Working Democrats caucus? Well, I, th I think that uh, they're implementing a part of the idea. The part that they're not implementing, which I think you're you're pointing at is they're not democratic organizations where you, you know we we would like in a real party that we want a democratic structure in which the base is going to have control over basically making big decisions about 
you know, what the policies they want and the strategies they want to implement. And in the United States right now, we have a candidate-centered uh, politics in which basically, you know, candidates develop a uh, platform and then they basically recruit their supporters. And that's kind of playing out in, uh, for, for us, uh, for the left also in, in this context. Uh, so, um, for example, uh, you, you know, I think like Justice Democrats goes through a vetting process and, and choosing, you know, who are they going to support and then they, they help train those, those candidates and they choose those candidates based on a particular uh, on, on, the, on supporting their values, uh, which is quite important, but it's, you know, it's a relatively small group of people that are, that are making those decisions. And, you know, I think if we can form a, you know, a party that those, that that process would be open up to, you know, regular people participating in it, we'd, we'd still want to, you know, uh, tap into people's expertise and, and take advantage of that, but we also need to think through, you know, how do we, how do we organize large, you know, democratic uh, organizations and, and let regular people, you know, in the end, uh, make the big decisions. Okay. So, so in other words, we need to democratize whatever formations we have already. So even though we're building on existing organizing, even that existing organizing needs to be democratized, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I want to sort of explore this thread a little bit more too, um, with respect to though the obstacles that we will encounter. Uh, for example, uh, one of the points you make is that we, we're in, a, in a, a fundamentally oligarchic system with, with respect to access to the polls, uh, or at least access to politics. Uh, there are structural obstacles to us maximizing turnout and that sort of thing. How do you see the Working Democrats Caucus overcoming these structural obstacles? Sure. The, the, big, the biggest structural obstacle in the United States is that money buys politics. So there has been a number of studies, a really good work done by, uh, I think his first name is Thomas, Thomas Ferguson. Uh, and, and it's basically, uh, he argues that, that, uh, you know, that elections are basically bought and paid for. So I believe there's like 91% uh, of the candidates who, who get the most amount of donations in congressional elections win. And so uh, that's a, a huge determinant. And so um, uh, in the current system, it's how do you raise that much money? Well, really only a, a, only a small percentage of Americans ever give to any political uh, campaign. And, the, and uh, even a smaller amount give more than only like point five percent less than one percent half a percent give more than two hundred dollars to any campaign in the united states but then those that small percentage is dominated by super rich people like sheldon adelstein he gave like a hundred and twenty million dollars in the for the 2016 presidential election so uh that money limits uh what uh, working class participation and democratic control in the election. So what a um, working democratic caucus could do, uh, you know, uh, uh, elaborating on what's been already being done by the Sanders campaign and uh, our revolution and, and justice Democrats is basically raising mass uh, mass uh, small donations to support a an institution. So, for example, I just hypothetically in the paper I say if we can get 10 million people to join a potential uh, uh, working uh, Democrats caucus, then if each of them gave $100 a year, that would be a billion dollars a year for for organizing 
and for uh, doing electoral work. And it would make, even though that's still going to be less than what capitalists could raise, it makes people viable. So I think in, in elections, like you, we don't have to totally outraise the, the capitalist parties. We just have to get to a threshold where then activism can make people viable. So for, for example, um, in the recent uh, campaigns that were run by uh, uh, Jamal Bauman and Cory Bush, neither of them raised more money than their opponent, but they raised enough money that they were viable. And so I think it's a matter of like raising a billion dollars a year, probably some people are saying, oh, that's ridiculous. We could never do that. But really it's, it's not out of the ordinary. Like I said, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily not imaginable. Uh, Bernie Sanders raised a quarter of a billion dollars each, each of his runs. And he got uh, uh, 7 million. I don't know how many donations he got this time. He got 7 million do donations last time. So if we can turn that into, you know, regular support for a party. And I think that, again, when people see it, that there's something viable that they give to and that it could work, they're going to be more likely to jump in. And it's kind of like, you know, when, you ha when you're rooting for a baseball team or a basketball team and your, your team starts to win, you're more likely to pay attention and get involved in that, uh, that that's going to same thing happens in politics. And so, uh, uh, and we can think of lots of organ, like I, the, there are mass organizations like the AARP in the United States uh, has, I think, 38 million members and they have an annual budget of $1.6 billion. So we, you know, we're imagining we want to take power from the most powerful capitalist class in history. In order to do that, we need to at least raise a billion dollars a year, right? And to, to have a big organization to do that. So we, we got to start thinking big like that. And I think, it, you know, I, I don't think it's, a, it's out of the realm of possibility. I think it's more out of our, what we imagine we can do. And, and, and it, it's also a matter of, like a, we have all these these different groups and they tend to come together in a coalition, but now we need to think about, well, how can we, you know, organize it even a more integrated level. So with a dedication to compete for power. Thanks, John. You know, I know that there are a number of uh, other questions waiting for you. Uh, however, for folks who are watching us on Facebook, I'd like to just summarize the six points that you've provided for us. Uh, as uh, the, the sort of framework for the Working Democrats focus. I'll just go ahead and read that out before going back to you with a question and then turning it over to Joe and Linda for other questions and perhaps bringing in people. So one, the Working Democrats caucus must build on current organizing. It'll secondly, it will plan big and imagine organization that can scale to compete with capitalist parties, which is kind of the point you're making right now. And number three, if we organize uh, the working class to consistently vote, we will win. The working de uh, fourthly, the working Democrats uh, focus will have to organize a comprehensive fight for our democratic rights. That's something I'd like to speak about a little bit more. Number five, the working democratic uh, Democrats caucus must model innovative mass, pla uh, mass participatory democracy. And finally, it must inspire mass participation in order to inspire mass participation, it has to have a platform that must envision a transformed political economy on democratic and egalitarian uh, values. So the question I have for you that comes up a lot, especially in, in the current moment where the Democrats seem to have, uh, if you'll forgive a market analogy, captured the market with respect to diversity and the at least symbolic politics of inclusion, right? How are we to organize the working class, which itself is extremely diverse, has demands that are universal in nature, and yet has parts of that working class with very particular demands in need of targeted, um, uh, uh, targeted programs that speak to their needs in order to build 
the, the working class as a working as a working class identity. So how do we balance these universalizing and these particular targeted programs in terms of the structure of the Working Democrats Caucus? Sure. Uh, well, the 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 last point is you know we need to create a platform that excites people, and I think you know the the Sanders campaign did that, and I think for example the the Green New Deal uh, as it's being fleshed out, and you know when it was originally proposed, uh, it's kind of going through a number of iterations and developing, and, and uh, as it becomes more and more detailed, it creates both, uh, you know, general changes and specific, you know, specific changes. So you can imagine, you know, let's think through um, uh, universal health care and a Medicare for all. So as, as a platform where we need to argue for Medicare for all, but we also know that there, that different groups uh, are excluded from our current medical system in very specific ways. And, and we're going to have to, once we, uh, 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 you know, start to make a plan, to, you know, let's say that, you know, that we got into power and we started to implement a Medicare for all, then we need to start making also plans that to make that, uh, to make uh, healthcare really work for everybody, we also need to be thinking through, well, how do we uh, address environmental racism, which really undercuts uh, uh, people of color's health that live, that live in um, uh, uh, areas that have been environmentally neglected or treated as, as uh, places that we can dump our trash or, or uh, manufacture or What's, I forget the name of the zone in, in Louisiana where they do a lot of the pharmaceutical and oil manufacturing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that's, you know, something we, we need, that'd be like a specific area that we would need to address to also address uh, quality health care for all. So you know, we can make any, the, we can make any platform plans that address multiple types of oppression. So, you know, in, in capitalism, you, you know, there's lots of different uh, iterations of, of oppressions. And so as on the left, we have this challenge, like how do we bring all these diverse groups together with, that have some similar uh, uh, experiences with oppression, but then some different ones and integrate our demands all into one. And I think we do it by putting forward this, this universal ideas that can attract everybody, but then in the, in, in threshing out the details, we, we need to have specific plans to address specific types of oppression. Thanks, John. John, I know that Joe has a question um, that, uh, that takes us back to the beginning in some ways about the viability of the, the overall project. Um, Joe, do you want to, uh, want to go ahead and frame that question? Yeah, thanks, Seren, and thanks, John, again. Um, you've spoken to it a little bit when you started to talk about how, in fact, a working class progressive party could raise a billion dollars. But I wanted to push on that a little bit because I know in your article, this issue of viability, both the reality and the perception of viability, John, really intersects with this question of electability, right? Which is very easy to mock, right? in the sense that elect perceptions of electability can very easily stand in the way of people asserting what they actually themselves want, right? This idea that, you know, we vote for what we think other people might want and accept rather than what we want, right? And you can certainly unpack that as like a, but, but I, I was struck by your paper in, in the sense of how you took that seriously, right? Which is, you know, one thing I took away from your paper was it's not enough to have a candidate people agree with but they also, there's this like other meta level to it. It has to be a campaign or a project that they think could actually win, right? This question of, of not only being viable, but seeming viable, right? Is actually part of what it takes to be viable. And so, I mean, that was my, my take on your paper, but I wanted to, or one take, but I wanted to ask you this question. How does that 
understanding or your understanding, I don't want to put words in your mouth, correct me and refine your own point, but how does your understanding of this viability, electability question then reflect back on how you answer the question of like why Biden ended up defeating Sanders so soundly after the very promising and exciting Nevada primary where it looked like the right, uh, that looked like Sanders might sweep the board with this model. How do you read the turn to Biden? Do you see it as some people see it as right the product of just the, the elite of the party shutting things down? You seem to see it in a deeper way or in a different way. And I wanted to ask you to, to, to say a few words about how you read the, uh, the kind of turn to Biden or the victory of Biden over the Sanders campaign in 2020. Sure. Well, my, my hypothesis which I don't have any data on this, but this is my hypothesis, is I think that a uh, uh, number of people just basically did not believe that there was enough, enough institutional power behind, uh, behind uh, Bernie Sanders to carry him to victory. And so, uh, you know, he, he and the, there was like, um, there was like right after he won in Nevada, and you know, in that time, you saw Bloomberg who dropped, you know, a half a billion dollars over a couple of weeks to try to de try to basically delegitimate uh, Bernie Sanders. And in addition, you know, all of the establishment media came out and basically started red baiting Bernie and and going on the attack. And I think that. Uh, a number, I'm just, I'm thinking a number of people just thought, well, if the capitalist class unites around Trump, that they're going to prefer Trump to Sanders, that we won't be able to win. And, and so they were, even though they liked Bernie's platform, they tended to go with, uh, they tended to go with the safe, the safer bet. You know, they, they didn't want to ab abandon this kind of rocky, coalition between some capitalist and the the working class to, to defeat Trump that that Trump was you know and he is a very threatening figure and and you know he, I believe he is an existential threat and and I I just didn't think enough people believed in Bernie and also the left didn't come together we didn't unite so war the Warren camp you know the Warren campaign was and the Sanders campaign never came together in, with it for a united front. And so I think it was also, also just a self-assessment of, of our working class unity and whether we, would, we were determined enough to push Sanders over the finish line. And I think enough people came to the conclusion that we weren't, that we, we didn't that we that Sanders wasn't elected, and the way a if we had something like a working democratic Democrats caucus in which people had you know experiences of the working class staying united through a, a lot of uh, of different um, political uh, projects, then when it comes to pushing the next Bernie Sanders over the line. I think the working class would have more confidence that they could do it. Yeah, thanks for that, John. If I can have a follow-up, I mean, I mean, what you you emphasize the viability of this strategy, but you also don't, uh, you know, you don't uh, swoon us with uh, like illusions about how easy this would be. One one statistic that struck me from your piece was the scale regarding the scale of the challenge that there are in fact. Uh, what, 500,000 elected officials in the United States, right? 90,000 like local governments or local state or federal governments, 90 and, and 500,000 seats. And yet the, the combined candidates just endorsed, let alone won, right? Let alone winning of Justice Democrats, DSA and our revolution is like around not even 400. Right, so we are talking about a, the question of what, how to scale up politics without losing the mission is just crucial. But here, I want to play a little devil's advocate for those. You know, we are very sympathetic to your thesis here on shelter and solidarity, where we talk about inside-outside strategy. But um, 
What, what do you say to those that say the corporate parties, the capitalist structure, the fundraising, yada, 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 the bourgeois media are so compromised the terrain of at least national electoral politics in the U.S. that the left would be better off going to shifting the terrain, so to speak, to social movement, to the street, to the workplace, to some other place where working class people might be less alienated and see their potential power viability more. I'm curious what you say to that line of argument, which I do see heavily represented on at least my social media feed among activists that I may respect on many issues, even as I differ on this one. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Sure. Well, I think we need uh, a unified strategy where you're, you're doing lots of things at the same time. So, for example, uh, you know, in the last decade, uh, uh, perhaps the, the, where the left made the most uh, gains in the early 2000, in the, in the first decade of the 2000s was in, in gay rights. And, and you see uh, lots of work going on on multiple levels. There was uh, work going on at the cultural level where you have, you know, uh, different TV shows with uh, protagonists that are gay, and, and which is something new that never happened before. You had legal work going on, you had electoral work going on, and you had movement work going on where people are in the streets and, uh, they're, and in regards to don't ask, don't tell, there was a lots of confrontation of the Democratic Party and there was a lot of uh, pressure on uh, Obama later on about uh, advocating for gay marriage and the Democratic Party was, was reluctant. But because there was, you know, all these things going on in, in multiple terrains, uh, there was some big victories. And, and I think that's, we, we definitely need the movement part, but we also need the electoral part. So uh, for people that just think we need to organize in the streets, I don't see a viable way. How do we take, our goal is to take power. Well, how do we take power? Are we going to, is it going to be a, a violent revolution? Are we going to, are we going to wait for capitalism just to fall apart and then pick up this pieces? There, the, I, I haven't seen like a discussion about a strategic steps about how we get to power if we just totally drop electoral pol politics. Have, have you seen anything? Uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to speak for others. I mean, there certainly are people who think an insurrection, uh, the generalized riot, right? The, you know, the challenging of state power in a more direct form might be the way. I mean, certainly I don't want to, I don't want to elaborate on that in, in paraphrasing others, but uh, we can probably circle back to it. I want to let Seren ask one. I know Linda has a question ready too, but I want to cycle back to Seren and, and then we can work Linda in when it, when it works best. Yeah, I have a question that sort of follows on uh, from the kinds of topics we've just sort of broached right now. Uh, you know, I'm an immigrant to the United States, and one of the things that has frustrated me decade after decade of living in this country is the kind of polarization that happens within the broad left over how we should relate to the Democratic Party. Uh, generally, most people adopt the attitude, stop what you're doing, come do what I'm doing. And in fact, that never really happens. The different tendencies remain. And to summarize it, as I, I would say uh, there are three general approaches on the left, an inside and outside and an outside strategy, an inside, outside, outside strategy. Inside, the reform within the Democratic Party, an outside one, which is outside the two-party system, but within the realm of politics. And then outside, outside, which is uh, the social movements one, the kind of rebellion that we're seeing in the streets right now. And none of the three will disappear, uh, thankfully, I would say. And for me, uh, what, what would be interesting is to figure out a strategy wherein the, the three adherents of these different strands, or the, the, the three strands, acknowledge each is going to exist, each is going to be pushing forward, and that there, there needs to be some sort of grand vision about how these could act together in some sort of 
coordinated way. In some respects, what we see with the Democratic Party that there are social movements outside of them, particularly around, around um, reform of the police and all that operate outside the party sphere, but they influence groups within the Democrats. So even though the outside is often associated with more revolutionary activity, they found a way to coexist with forces within the Democratic Party. Uh, at the same time too, I notice a lot of very interesting and and I, I would think quite fertile projects have been taking, uh, taking place completely outside of the party system. To give you an example, Corporation Jackson in Mississippi or Corporation Humboldt in California. And I'm told that there are about 10 other cooperation type projects around the country. And these tend to focus locally, but they have a global analysis and alternative to capitalism. And so, um, I'm wondering what is it about the Working Democrats Caucus that, uh, as, a, as a model, as an ideal type, that would allow it to relate to these other strategies? And if, if it can relate to these other strategies and processes outside the Democratic Party, outside the institutional system, uh, what form does that sort of meta entity take that would allow the Working Democrats Caucus to relate to these other forms? Well, I would, I mean, ideally I'd hope that in the context of a working democratic caucus that, that all three uh, uh, tendencies could come together and debate and talk about and develop an integrated strategy together. Uh, I think, you know, I think it's a real weakness for the, for the way the left is currently organized. I mean, one of our you know, most common chants that we hear on the street, you know, this is what democracy looks like. Uh, but the left tends to do democracy only on a small scale. We all we do, we all have lots of little groups, and then you know when somebody in that group starts not liking somebody else, they you know separate and form another group. So uh, and we're able in in small groups, you know, where you're able to like do direct democracy, and it feels good, uh, but it's never going to be able to coordinate at a scale level to really compete for power. And so I think that one thing, a, a big project for the left is like, well, how could we organize, you know, institutions with several million or 10 million people or even 100 million people and still have uh, a participatory democratic structure um, and, and I think it's really important, even in thinking about in the long run, if we're going to have socialism, we're going to have to have large, what look like large corporations now run democratically. So how could we organize Walmart or Amazon democratically? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, I haven't seen people, I, people often say in the, in the socialist literature, oh, we need to organize everything democratically, but they rarely talk about the nuts and bolts about how to do that. And, and so we need to start, if we wanna to compete to power, all those three tendencies need to work together and we need to come together and create an institution in which we can really hammer out a strategy that's gonna uh, be coherent and, and where, where the different components could can plan to be complementary and push towards uh, the you know, generating the power we need to to uh, to take power. John, before I turn to Linda, I, I'd like to follow up on this a little bit. You, you give us a sense of the scale, like Walmart is the, at, at least at some point was the largest corporation in the world before I think Apple overtook it, right? Um, at least in measured in terms of revenue. Uh, but uh, you, you give us a sense of the geographic reach of the, the, the organized democracy or in order to run a Walmart-like entity. And you, you give us a sense of the uh, almost the, the the difficulty, the the great distance from where we are right now to where we need to be, right? Um, at the same time, in the in the in the article, you outline a set of uh, reforms, including the Green New Deal, 
uh, that, that seem quite modest by, uh, by comparison to running a Walmart scale entity. And yet, when we look at the present moment, capitalism has really failed palpably in, in, in that it cannot meet even our basic needs, uh, where production, it seems, needs to be organized at least through the state, regardless of whether it's democratic or not, because capitalists can't come up with the things we need in order to survive the pandemic. Um, so, so the question then becomes, to what extent should we depend on incremental reforms? Or should we still hold, reserve our, opt, our right to revolution? You know, the sense that the system itself is impossible. The Green New Deal demands seem to pale in comparison to the needs of the moment. Or am I just being hopeless? Yeah. Here? <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, you know, by, well, one, and one problem with like, just talking about revolution is that it's, it's pretty vague, right? It's, it's almost, a lot of times on the left, it's like a religious belief. It seems like religion to me. It's like people talk about rev the revolution like Christians talk about the second coming. And, and uh, we, we need to, in the left, we need to think a lot more about well, what does that revolution mean? How are institutions going to run? What specifically are we going to do? And so if we're, like, for example, if we're able to implement a Green New Deal, there's a lots of components to that that would be, uh, you know, a huge change to what we're doing now. We, you know, besides, we need, besides planning for a, uh, a um, renewable energy infrastructure, we would need uh, a, an investment a democratically controlled investment bank to uh, to uh, uh, decide where the investments go. We'd have to plan for you know what we'd have to really develop uh, new companies uh, to build that infrastructure. We'd have to decide how to organize those companies. And so, by putting together something concrete like the Green New Deal and doing it we'll be developing the skills to, uh, and developing the, the class confidence to, to start pushing for something bigger and, and more, you know, revolutionary and start be able to, and, and to start to be able to be specific about what we mean about revolution by kind of making the road as we go. John, I know Linda has a question. I can't resist asking you one other question, though. Uh, the, when we take uh, examples like, when we take something that sounds very straightforward, democratizing investment, you know, and, and the need for a national bank, and you, you quote Chuck Collins to this effect, too. Um, we have to recognize that everywhere else, at least in the advanced industrial countries, where workers' parties have existed and came to power, the moment they start to question that investment function, as in the Meitner plan in, in Sweden, you know, a country of 10 million people, um, that's when they, when they seem to have, you know, um, caught the, the tiger by the tail and are soon bitten. Uh, and that seems to provoke the question then, you know, reform versus revolution. Capitalists well, won't idly buy while we democratize the investment function. Yeah, I and mean, part of our, our planning needs to be planning for the capitalist backlash. So, uh, you know, yeah, we need to plan for a capital strike. Uh, when, you know, we, uh, we would need to like set up an institution uh, that, would, that could, you know, handle a capitalist strike. So, so, so for example, right now, uh, when I, basically the state is subsidizing capitalism right now with the CARES Act, it, uh, you know, a large part of that act was pumping like between five and six trillion dollars into supporting the asset market. Uh, you, you know, so the CARES Act lended a half a billion dollars to, I mean, half a trillion dollars to the, uh, uh, the Fed. And then the Fed has created a variety of mechanisms to hand that money out to the, 
the, the capitalist. So, you know, we need to come up with a, you know, there's crisis capitalism and we need crisis socialism. You know, we, we need to have plans in place for how to deal with capital strikes and how, and, you know, plans, we're just going to have to like, you know, if we're going to have, you know, at some point, like take over some institutions, like this would be a good time to take over the oil industry because, it, you know, that's value is so low and, and we could, it's possible to make a plan for winding it down. And, and so, yeah, I think, and I think by having an organization uh, where, you know, we're, we're all planning together, it, it will help us be bold to start making those plans where we have an institutional backing where we think we could even implement those plans. Thanks, John. I'll turn to Linda now who has a question. Okay, yeah, so, so I'm a faculty at UMass Boston. It's a public university. Um, and I teach undergrads. And so, so in the classroom, when, um, when I'm talking about organizing for transformative change, particularly when it comes to problems and issues that uh, affect my students, uh, many of whom are uh, working class, immigrants, um, poor students, non-traditional students, uh, students of color. And, and so whenever I talk about uh, transformative change, I'm often met with either this uncomfortable silence or a kind of um, deep-seated cynicism or hopelessness uh, from the students. And it's really disheartening uh, to sense and hear this homelessness, this hopelessness and demoralization, particularly coming from young people. And um, I'm just wondering, do you agree that hopelessness is a problem and wondering also if you have any proposals for how, how to address, how to address this. Sure. Yeah. Yes. I think hopelessness and cynicism is our big problems. I think that, you know, we've been, uh, that the, the way forward through, you know, for the last, 50 years, especially under neoliberal capitalism, it seemed like all the doors are shut and, and there's no possibilities for, for change. And uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and you know, just on a personal level, when you work with somebody who's in, uh, even when they're in abusive situations, when they feel no hope, they stay in that situation uh, uh, until they can see uh, an, an avenue out of there. So part, a lot of times it seems on the left that it's, we make this assumption that if it gets so bad that people will change or if we can convince them that it's so corrupt, they're going to change. Uh, but I think a big part of it is we need to uh, build kind of a, a, the mechanism for where alternatives seem viable and that's what the Sanders campaign did this last did did this year. So when it looked like he had a possibility to win, a lot of people were hopping in and were real excited and, and the the excitement was palpable. And so if we can institutionalize that, if we can create an institution in which, you know, everybody's where people are coming together and where, you know, millions of people that know that other millions of people have their back. That I think that's what will doing quality organizing. That's will, you know, give people hope and the sense of solidarity to, to make to start taking risks for big change. John, I I, I like this idea that uh, this list it's an almost imponderable dimension. The sense of hope, and uh, that's something I certainly got from reading your piece. I'd I'd like to tease it out just one more time and, and in a bit of a different direction. Um, we, 
what we see right now, especially within the Democratic Party, are a number of groups that are associated with communities of color. They, they tend to be um, uh, well-financed compared to left-wing organizations, primarily because of their capacity to counter the uh, voter suppression or their potential to counter the voter suppression in their communities. So you have organizations like Block by Block doing work to get voters out in Milwaukee, in places like Detroit, Pittsburgh, uh, and Philadelphia, the four or five cities that will really determine the outcome, at least of the presidential election. Um, and so I get a lot of hope from the fact that the Democrats, even uh, against their leadership's preferences, are forced to activate their base every time through investing in these groups. The question I have is, to what extent can the left reach out to and connect with these entities um, that, that operate within the Democratic Party without which the Democrats have no hope of national power and yet whom the Democrats inevitably disappoint? Uh, I'm not familiar with those specific groups, but yeah. it's those it's those type of groups that I would hope would make the backbone of the working democratic caucus. You know, uh, we need that's it's that kind of on the ground uh, organizing that could put us over. So, really, if if we uh, if we organize the working class. In, in the United States, where everybody voted, uh, with the working a working class uh, party could dominate uh, dominate politics. So I read this this paper in which, um, if we took just uh, all single women, uh, all people of color, and all people younger than thirty five, that makes up sixty percent of the electorate right there. So, and all those groups lean heavily towards, you know, progressive politics. The, the problem is that uh, the people that are disenfranchised tend not to vote. You know, that in presidential elections, the people vote about a little above 50%. In, in, a, in a off year uh, federal elections, they grow vote, uh, you know, in the 40s. And in local elections, they can vote down around 20%. But if, if we got people voting, uh, you know, everybody votes every time, there's, there's a potential that we could dominate. And, and so, again, it's within our, uh, it's kind of like, in order to get there, we need to challenge the cynicism and hopelessness. And, by, and we do that by developing solidarity. And I think the solidarity, the people are going to feel solidarity in the context of an institution, it, where and if we have like a uniting institution, that it's really going to help people feel that sense of power, and I think that's what could help us uh, really make the next move from uh, the exciting organizing that's gone in on the five years and kind of and moving to the next level. Thanks, John. Joe. Thanks, Seren. Thanks, John. So at this point, a little over an hour into our conversation, as usual, we will be bringing uh, our live Zoom audience. And if we do see a Facebook question, we can try to uh, grab that too. So far, I have two folks. I'd like to give people a chance to uh, speak. Um, we'll take at least two comments or questions so we can get a few more voices involved. And then we'll go back to John and Seren and maybe Linda and I have a, a thought or two. Uh, so first, let's go to Tim. Tim, you had a question, comment about health care. Thank, thank you, Joe. But I, I'd like to ask something a little, a, a little bit different of John, which is a, that's bedeviled me for, for a long time. How do we undo the myths or convince people that the myths that the capitalist class perpetrates are, in fact, falsehoods? How do we open people's eyes that there are, there are illusions? For, for example, that capitalists earn their wealth when in fact they steal it from workers and consumers. How do we convince people? And perhaps your training as a clinical psychologist would help you, uh, you know, uh, think about this, but how do we open people's eyes that the, that these myths are really myths and they're used against them? 
Thanks, Tim. Uh, let's take Bruce and actually we're going to wor work uh, Mark uh, Soderstrom into here as well. We'll take three before we go back to the panelists. Bruce. Okay, I'm, I'm actually going to bounce off Tim's comment, um, which was about unions and how a lot of union leadership opposes Medicare care for all, or at least is very hesitant because it, it erodes their, their, their raison d'etre, right? The, the employer negotiated, you know, benefits, right? Um, or it, um, you know, when they look at the numbers, they, they worry that the cost is going to come down to their members and that, that it's not going to offset the savings in, in healthcare. Um, so Tim's idea was maybe a healthcare for all that allows unions to, to, to feel part of it. And, and here I'm talking about the big bureaucratic unions. My comment bounces off that in the sense that I'm in a small, you know, fairly progressive union, United University Professions. Um, even our leaders, um, despite the fact that we're, we're on record for decades now supporting single payer, um, have brought up these, these hesitancies uh, you know, and, and it's played out in, in, in questions within UUP and NYSIT uh, over endorsements. Um, you know, it wasn't a done deal that, that, that Bernie would have won endorsements from any of our unions in a democratic process. So my question, I guess, for, for John and for Saran has to do with, you know, unions seem to be one of these institutions that are longstanding, that could become the basis of a democratic workers party. How do we organize within them? How do we democratize them? How, how do we make them um, not kind of try to choose the, the least objectionable capitalists, but, but, but to, to build power, um, you know, and not just a 30,000 member union, but 100,000 know, or, or million member unions? Um, how, do you, how do you get even the people who should be on our side on our side? Thank you, Bruce. And I know it's going to be a lot, but I think we can handle one more. Mark Soderstrom. Well, and this builds direct, you know, this is almost the flip side of Bruce here, which is, you know, I'm also a union member. I don't, I do contribute to a certain, Leo's you know, kind of a working democratic caucus by contributing to my union's political fund. And by contributing to that political fund, that socializes my money into a significant amount of money to sort of counter the massive corporate donations of Edelson or the Cox. Um, I mean, part of my question is, I don't see, we haven't, you, I haven't heard from you, John, much about the union movement, but I don't see the possibility of creating a working democratic caucus without democratizing and working inside our unions because at the moment, uh, the major democratic donors are AFT, AFSCME, and SEIU. They dwarf every other donor for the Democratic Party. Um, and I think this is in part why the Republicans were so dead set on getting Janus through the Supreme Court. But the flip side is that Janus also frees unions to be more political than they have been in the past in which unions were not allowed to take a, much of a politically active role. Um, so again, my sort of building on Bruce, but I'm more optimistic about the potential of working with the unions and, and the new movement, because we've seen a lot of social movement, you know, movement, social unionism movements in places like Chicago that are pro Medicare for all that are not the old establishment where the unions came out during the Truman presidency to defeat uh, health care for all because it affected their bargaining. We're seeing more unions willing to go, we need to benefit the working class as a whole, not just our membership or else we'll die as institutions. And I think some of the new union activists we're seeing begin to recognize that, that business only for their members is a dead end. Uh, and I've spoken too much, but I'd love to hear your response. Thank you, Mark. All right, a couple of interrelated questions, each one building on the previous, which is how we like it. Uh, John, Seren? Uh, should I go right now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, number one, uh, addressing, well, how do we address uh, all the myths that sustain uh, capitalism, in particular that capitalists uh, earn their money? Well, I think, uh, one, there's a lot of good stories to tell, like the, the CARES Act uh, and uh, 
basically the last 10 years since the 2008 uh, uh, crisis, you know, capitalism has basically been subsidized. We've had uh, social, you know, socialism for capitalism, capitalists. And, uh, you know, literally, you know, trillions of dollars now have been uh, funneled through the Fed to support the capitalist class. And we need to call it out. Uh, you know, how do we get that message out? I think we need to write another paper like this and more and think more about how do we better organize our left media. So kind of like our kind of like our political organizations, we we organize our left media from what I've you know, I'm not in media, so maybe some of you could tell me different, but it seems like we organize it on the small business you know, model where each organization is organizing by itself and uh, you know, tries to get fundraised by itself and uh, you know, is almost in competition with other media groups. And uh, so again, we, we need to think about how could we have a united uh, left media and could it be sustained with, through uh, a larger membership structure to support and to support all media and, and you know, to basically creating an alternative to the capitalist media. Uh, unions and, and healthcare in particular. Uh, I also am in one of the more progressive unions, but I'm also frustrated with the, the bureaucratic structure of the union. And I think, it, you know, for building progressive agenda, agendas, we're going to have to like work, first work with the progressive unions and let them set the like the the, na the uh, um, national nursing union and the Chicago teaching teachers union and um, uh, kind of let them set the agenda. So you know, not you know. There is some change, like most unions didn't come out and endorse Biden early on or endorse a, 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 a candidate early on. They are at least neutral and let it kind of play out. And, you know, we're, we're going to have to work in our unions. And we also need to think about, well, how can we have better democratic structures in the, in the, in the unions? And uh, we, we, um, on the left, we haven't really thought a lot about how do we democratize these these uh, bureaucratic structures on our side and then make them more accountable uh, and make them. Uh, and I'm also concerned about unions working together. Like even throughout this pandemic, there's been no united like un union front against the horrible mismanagement of the pandemic by Trump. So literally thousands of workers have died and unions haven't really stepped up and there's been individual unions that have done it, but not as a group altogether. So it's, that's been problematic and I'm not really sure how to address that, but it's something we need to address. Uh, I think I addressed, I addressed all the issues that, did I miss anything? No, I, I don't think so. I, I would like to supplement uh, what, what you said a little bit by cherry picking a little. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic and when the uh, sharp economic disruption was becoming apparent, it, you know, some union leaders actually got together to reaffirm their faith in capitalism, right? They, they basically issued a joint statement to that effect. At the same time, and with respect in particular to healthcare, I think Bernie taught us a lot in Nevada, right? Where you saw a healthcare union, not a healthcare, hospitality workers union uh, coming out, um, essentially, uh, officially taking a neutral position with respect to Bernie, but articulating a critique of Medicare for all, arguing that this was a benefit we delivered to our, uh, to our members. Uh, how dare you tamper with it, right? There is a healthcare benefit. And their own members, right, voted against uh, Biden and the others and for Bernie. And uh, they, they saw their families as needing Medicare, uh, Medicare for all, because they were not covered 
by the union contract. They're, they're, family, they're members of their extended family, which leads to another interesting point. Unions, you know, for better or worse, now represent a fraction, a tiny fraction of the working class as a whole. And to the extent that unionized workers can be encouraged to think about their broader connections to the family, like those workers in Nevada, right? Their broader connections to other working class people. I think we have uh, the prospects for for them to push their unions in a more universalizing direction. And and so the outcome of the Nevada election was, was I think, really instructive for how we should form strategy. Another thing to think about is that family structures are different uh, across the working class. And certainly in Nevada, the Southwest, California, and Texas, um, you know, we, we have uh, a stronger sense of extended families than we have where the working class has been extremely um, uh, uh, subject to, ex uh, to, to extreme fragmentation. And uh, even within the working class family, you find that people are more individual and family focused. But to the extent that newer parts of the, the working class and um, uh, especially where there's the Latinx majority and people coming in, immigrant workers from the global south, there are other conceptions of the family. The rationality is different from the exclusive um, uh, rationality that's developed within the old unions as part of the old working class. So we should also take into account transformations that are happening within the working class. Uh, do, I had a question for you on, on the media question, since you work in media, do, do you have any thoughts about how to better organize left media to, to, to counter, to, to basically, uh, you know, to create an alternative to corporate media? Hey, who's that a question for, John? I thought for Sarin or any of you. Any of us, yeah. You all, you all are in media. So. I was actually, Sarin, can I step into that first here? Yeah. Let's see. So actually, Sarin and I were having a, a chat about this. We chat about many things, constantly working on various projects. Um, and one of them was on the question of, you know, recognizing this moment we're in and how there's been this proliferation of podcasts, right? And letting we're one of them right? Unapologetically, right? We've built something. We haven't just, you know, worked with, we've worked in existing organizations, but we're, we are, you know, I guess you could see it through that small business mentality um, critique. But um, the question is, how could we, you know, cr create a forum on this show or, or in the journal that we work with, Socialism and Democracy? What about a digest of the different web webinars and podcasts that are out there that actually is trying to distill and crowdsource what are the key takeaways that, that are coming out of these conversations. I mean, where's the synthesis? You know, I do think, right, I do think there's something to be said for small conversations. I don't think we all want to just be dumped into, you know, anybody who's been on a 10,000 person webinar knows that it's, it has strengths and, you know, it, and it has weaknesses in terms of a, a mode of communication. But, but the danger is, right, we have this great, perhaps, I mean, I think, Tim, you mentioned some people are calling this a new renaissance of, of cultural uh, digital uh, creation during this pandemic. Uh, how, how do we move towards a synthesis? And I mean, I don't really have a great answer for that. One thing is I would love to see a kind of left digest of media that was really committed to making it possible for people to link up and, and, and connect and not just competing right? Competing for those hits and those likes and maybe a corporate sponsor someday, the, the, the hidden, right, subtext of a lot of these independent projects. Maybe MBS, NS, MSNBC will pick me up. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other thought I have is this for this show itself. I mean, we, we aspire to bring together people from existing organizations to not necessarily always in the form of debate, but to have a cross-pollination of ideas that's not in a strictly uh, zero-sum register, Right, the idea. So, um, you know, to try to create, contribute to that democratic culture you talk about, right? Which is that to see the other people on the left, even if we have sharp differences or personality conflicts or whatever, to see that we need each other ultimately, and we need to cultivate a culture where we can have disagreements, even sharp ones, right? Without feeling like we need to split, cut ties, denounce. So we're trying to model that a little bit, which is, I mean, something about the democratic culture, but I think we do need, I don't know, this, I don't know what y'all think about this idea of a digest. You know, we have book, we run book reviews in journals. Why not um, media reviews, right? That are really short, meant to, 
to allow people to develop familiarity and, and enable coalitions and, and cross-pollination instead of this kind of siloization that actually ends up reinforcing the competitive isolation narrowness of the dominant system. So anyway, those are two attempts at a media answer. And I also think the union question is very important too, but I'll, I'll leave that for Linda and for others. I'll, I'll take a bite to that apple too. Um, uh, uh, one way to avoid the sort of small business model approach to things, although I think there's, 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 there's an, that's an important part for us to, to pursue, uh, certainly to develop our training wheels for other kinds of projects, for other kinds of engagement in the media. But there's also a political question that I think allows us to gain access uh, that if answered, if we can answer a certain political question, we may be able to gain access to more mainstream media. For example, the New York Times has done an incredible job on certain racial justice kinds of questions, like their, their 1619 series that they've published, you know, marking the 400th anniversary of slavery in the United States. And in general, a lot of very left-wing people of color are now getting access to the media in ways that uh, was just not possible before. And uh, I'll give you one example, right? So we produced this volume on the elections. Whoops. It's called Turnout, Mobilizing Voters in an Emergency. It's an anthology of about 30 people. It's not a left perspective in the sense that we have a lot of people who are from the center of the Democratic Party contributing to it as well. But what, we, what I found is that We've been able to get onto NBC, ABC, a lot of different channels with some of the people proposing um, essentially social democratic solutions to the COVID crisis, talking about the need for um, investing in public goods and, and that kind of thing. So I think that we, uh, to the extent that we can take advantage of, of the openings given to people of color by working with the left-wing parts of people of or other communities of color that, that now get access to the media that are able to raise questions about police accountability and that kind of thing, to the extent that we're able to make alliances and work with one as a common purpose with those folks, right? We will be able to challenge the media in terms of its, uh, in terms of essentially its capitalism. And so, so I think that there are other ways to access the, the, the media, the mainstream media. We have to access the mainstream media for another reason. All the social media in the world gets you nowhere without the broadcast effect of the, of the big media. It, it's, the, it's the multiply effect, the amplifier of it all. So with the, with the Arab Spring, you know, you had Facebook coming to play a major role because you had Al Jazeera giving it the amplification, allowing it to go viral. And so we, we cannot surrender that mainstream media as a place that we need to impact. And I think that political alliances might give us access to the mainstream media. In terms of our own media, there are lots of really interesting projects. In Massachusetts right now, a friend of mine has been working on a bill that would create a Massachusetts commission on the media and look at, uh, eventually he hopes, look at issues like public funding for local media along the lines that were created with the public access channel. So there are really great things that would need the kind of John Lawrence treatment of the Working Democrats Caucus for the media as well. We need to look at practical models that will allow us to achieve scale. I think programs like ours, the Shelter and Solidarity and all, is sort of us working with training wheels in preparation for getting onto other kinds of media that speak to larger numbers of people. And so, so I think there's an important place for us. This is sort of the, uh, the, the protected space in which we can develop the skills we need. Okay. So. Okay. Yes, Linda? Yes, okay. So I think Mark had a, had a question or a follow-up. Oh, kind of a follow-up I'll try to turn into a question. I guess there's a way in which I get frustrated the way that we easily use the words union bureaucracy to dismiss an entire a massive history, a global history. Um, and we're talking here about 
having the imagination to organize 100 million people into donating 10 bucks a month, right? Or, or that we are going to organize to take over and run an international economy. And both those are gonna require a bureaucracy. Um, and I don't see that we're gonna be able to do that without the legacies, the structure, the institutions that have been built by the labor movement over the last hundred years. Um, and frankly, you know, if we can't figure out how to democratize our union bureaucracy, which has a democratic history and legacy, I don't see how we're going to democratize capitalism and finance, which doesn't have any kind of claim to a democratic heritage. Um, and the unions are, are very important with identity progressive politics, right? I mean, it is still the case that union membership is a more significant factor than even education when it comes to equalizing pay along gender lines. The union is also one of the most important factors of equalizing pay along racial lines in the United States. And that we sort of on the left can imagine that we will do better inventing something new from scratch that has no resources come with it rather than capture an institution that has a lot of power and resources really boggles my, my, my brain, you know, coming out, I was an old IWW member, right? The union is all. Um, so why do we imagine that building from scratch around Bernie's campaign is going to be more successful than trying to capture an institutional center of power that has a century of history behind it. What can we do to change our imagination so that we can, we can imagine recapturing union bureaucracy as well as capturing the bureaucracy of finance and capital? Um, yeah, Mark, I, I mean, I wanna hear John's response to that, but I, I would like to tag onto it and Linda may as well. I mean, we've been, I, I really agree with your, your point that I think it's very important for people who are in unions to, to think about forming democratic, maybe working democratic caucuses, you know, to take over uh, union leadership, right? And, and in fact, we've done that at UMass Boston. I mean, um, we didn't conceive of it in quite those terms, but we've, we've been, Linda and I both have been part of a multi-year process to, that started by, uh, you know, just started with frustration and complaint about, you know, previous modes of leadership within our local and, 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 and then, then went to an unsuccessful campaign to unseat the, the president and then move forward into a, what we call the caucus for a democratic union, which now, I mean, you know, happens to, you know, essentially, I don't want to put it into mechanical terms, but we've had a, a major influence over the leadership of our union, what elected most of the executive committee and the president and vice president of our union. And it's, I mean, we're in the early throes of this. And of course, COVID hit and has, and austerity has hit, and we're dealing with a lot of terrain not of our own choosing. I don't want to paint some glowing picture, but there's been a major cultural strategic shift within our union within the last six months since we took the presidency of the union. And, and I think it's, it's starting to bear fruit in, in turning a, you know, a thousand member uh, uh, unit, uh, bargaining unit into, you know, a hub of progressive activism where at least a third, I'm, I'm hoping we can get a half of those people to actually be active participants in, in various, various progressive causes. So I do think we shouldn't, you know, abandon terrain we already have some foothold on and we need to really think about resources concretely. And, it, and I think patience, I mean, I think one thing I took from John's article is that we, we need to be robust and bold and transformative and, and also concrete and patient. We have thousands and thousands, whether it's insurrection or election, we have, what is it, 500,000 elected positions, 90,000 various governments in this country. We have, we have to have a cult. I mean, I think part of the imagination question, Mark, is that a lot of the left is like fueled on like impatience, you know? The system's so fucked, it needs to be overthrown now. And that's like true, but it's also like that impatience with the system gets translated into like impatience with organizing, I think. Like we need to be urgent, but not impatient, especially not with each other and, and not with the strategy because this is gonna be a process. I mean, maybe it can move quicker than, than I'm, I'm suggesting, but I, I, anyway, I, I, I'm just big plug for uh, organizing with people, even starting small and taking over your local unions uh, in, a, in a democratic way. I mean, shall we say unleashing, liberating your local union from things that are holding back its potential. 
Uh, I don't know if Linda, you want to add to that, but and Linda was one of the founding members of this co Democratic caucus as well. And we've, in some sense, we met through it, really, as more than anywhere else. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I have to say is that the, I think the, the caucus was actually the most successful, um, I think, group uh, for taking over the union. I, I think it had been tried before um, and the, the incumbent was never unseated until we established this caucus. Um, and uh, once the caucus was, was strong and, and we each had our, we each had our, um, our sort of duties, um, that was the year that we won. So, um, so I do think that, that caucuses within organizations are really or can be can be really important for taking power. In well, some that, sense, and training for for uh, leading too, right? Because developing the capacities that then allow you to come into leadership and actually do shit, you know, not just be protesting other people's shit, you know, right? To actually do good shit rather than just being kind of locked in perpetual opposition. You know, which is, you know, an understandable feeling many people have in a country like this, but it's certainly not adequate. John and Seren? Uh, a lot of great ideas and thoughts. Uh, uh, first, it's, it's great to hear, Linda, that you basically use the caucus structure to reform an institution. So it's basically, it's, I'm just advocating doing a similar process on, in a different, in a larger institution. And then, Mark, your idea that you know, uh, I think you're right in that uh, bureaucracy is necessary in large institutions. Like we're gonna, we're gonna have to have like standardized procedures for doing complex tasks and, you're, and we're gonna want experts to do it. And, and so the question is like, just for how do we organize that in a, we gotta think through like, you know, maybe new ideas about think of how to organize that democratically. So, for example, one interesting idea that I've seen recently was uh, the, demo the democracy in Europe movement, uh, 2025. Uh, it was founded by Giannis Varoufakis and uh, other people. And uh, anyways, they've set up an interesting structure where they have they have a a coordinating panel of people, a coordinating committee that's elected of 12 people with no president, but a in particularly uh, interesting structure they set up was called a validation committee. And so through sortation, they randomly pick uh, people from the party. And uh, that, uh, I think it's 100 people and that validation committee basically reviews all the decisions made by the coordinating committee. So maybe that idea of like randomly picking, you know, rank and file people to validate ideas would be another step towards, you know, instituting uh, bottom up democracy in the context of a bureaucracy. So I think we need to think about experimenting with democracy in that way in our in our organizations uh to 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 make them more to make them feel more accountable and to make people feel more connected to their to their organizations yeah and i, I would say to fellow worker mark so strong right of the iww that you won't get any argument from me as to the, the strategic importance of reforming the unions and uh, uh, seeing it as a valuable investment in a broader social change movement, as well as for the purposes of the actual bargaining unit that you're concerned about. Uh, I would add, though, that there are other working class institutions that also involve millions of people that we still need to democratize, credit unions being an example of these, right? There, there, there's several, I don't know, 50, 60 million people are members of credit unions. And these are all sort of parallel institutions to the typical capitalist institutions that could potentially replace them with a more democratic model. In addition, you know, corporations themselves often have democratic roots, right? So you, you can look at Ferrari, right? It began as a workers' cooperative, right? Um, 
But uh, apart from that, think about some of the financial institutions, particularly in the global south. Uh, these were, began as building societies, which accumulated money for people to enable them to buy their houses. And then it becomes this autonomous thing separate from the members. And eventually it just becomes another capitalist institution. So I think that you know, all large structures have the potential to be democratized to the extent that we connect them with their histories and memberships. And of course, uh, you know, there are going to be those institutions that we cannot democratize and must uh, supplant in other ways. So no arguments about, uh, you know, democratizing the union movement. Uh, I just wanted to make one other comment on something that Joseph said in regards to people that say, you know, we need a revolution now. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I guess one of my hypotheses that I'm positing is it's much more likely if we have a viable strategy that if people are going to would buy into this idea, it's, you know, uh, uh, it's, you're not going to get a lot of people following people that are calling for a revolution that are saying, yeah, let's overthrow it. And then we're going to figure out how to put food on the table tomorrow. You know, uh, you, you, we need to demonstrate uh, that we have a strategy and that we're that we have institutional capacity and, and that we are competent at meeting people's needs before people are going to take a leap of faith in, in pushing towards you know big change. Great, John. Uh, we have MJ uh, under well, it's Bannon the Pokey uh, who is asking. <laughs> To, uh, to speak, uh, and then uh, we will ask for just final questions, comments. Then I have at least one question for uh, Seren and John, and we'll let them make some closing comments as we do, uh, we've got, we are about an hour and 40, 45 minutes into this. Uh, MJ. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I've been up for 24 hours or something, so I, I, I fell asleep during some of this. I didn't catch the whole discussion, so I'm awake again. Uh, anyway, I know that this, I, I'm, I'm impressed by some of what I saw as far as the article that uh, John wrote, which I haven't, I haven't read yet, but it did reference the blueprint piece uh, from Jacobin from, I guess, 2016 or around there. I, I know that I, um, the last Boston DSA meeting that I attended, we were at this bar afterwards, and that article was cited, and I, I thought that it was kind of, it was really lamentable because much of that article is about a history, about all the attempts at third parties, and then there's like only like these last like two tiny little paragraphs about what, as far as I can remember, just about an alternative configuration that we could kind of do to somewhat shortcut around there. And I, I feel like that the discussion of this evening as well as, is somewhat replicating this idea that maybe if we change the configuration of our particular organizations, we can find a way how to address these big questions. And I think that a lot of times these discussions, we're kind of, we're moving away from the big question as far as a, well, how do we democratize our, our clubhouse and our treehouse? Um, and and I, I think that if you have like real mobilization in, in societies, you really have the, the public with you, it really doesn't matter as much about how democratic your particular organization, your alternative thing is. The last few months have obviously shown, obviously shown with all the Black Lives Matter activism and stuff like that. People, especially centrist politicians are now considering things that even many people on the left would have said like six months ago, oh, that's never ever gonna be possible. You understand what I'm saying? What I'm getting at is what, what I'm trying to say is like questions like how to democratize the union, I'm suggesting that people perhaps reflect on why should people spend so much time on replicating what we see in representative democracy and election mania, getting this politician versus that politician in our little tree houses when we don't actually know after we de democratize our unions, if our unions are gonna have the power to make the people that are really in, in charge of society to actually do what we want to. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm just kind of suggesting that people, we kind of reflect on that. If our unions don't have the power, what good is it to just have them democratized? And then I'm wondering if anybody has anything to kind of add about what I'm trying to get a pop. Yeah, get thanks MJ. No, that's very interesting, the question of, power and mobilization is maybe a, a, high, a higher priority than just democratizing the existing structures. Uh, Saran and John, you want to speak to that? So, uh, just, I, I want to clarify your question. So basically you're asking how does uh, 
organized in a democratic structure, how would that complement like the movement in the street? Is that, am I, am I getting that correct or is that off? No, I'm, I'm basic, what I'm saying is that, um, I, what, no, what, what I'm suggesting is that this, uh, our interest in dem democratizing an alternative institutions, you know, th that are kind of sitting around the table may be somewhat misplaced if we don't have real public mobilization to, you know, to put pressure on anybody. You know, because the unions have been saying forever, you know, vote for the Democrats because at least we'll have a seat at the table rather than being out on the street and being ignored. Yet, you know, the Democrats again and again and again and again, they just say, well, we'll take a, we'll, we'll, we'll consider, you know, we'll consider that next time or something. I, I don't know, perhaps I've still not been clear. Uh, uh, right. I mean, I, I, I think I'm getting you, but you can let me know if I'm off based on my answer. Uh, but, you know, I think it's important to, to do both. So, you know, uh, definitely like the movement in the street has created urgency and, and uh, you know, brought, uh, uh, made the demands of, of uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, vivid and, and uh, but, I think to, there's a lot, well, th to get justice, there's a lot that will go into that. And it'd be great if Black Lives Matter, for example, even had a larger democratic structure in which they could all agree on, you know, uh, uh, a large broad set of demands. Like for example, you know, reforming the police will also imply, you know, a economic redistrib you know, redistribution and, and racial economic justice? And what, what are the specific demands that they want to address that issue? It'd be great if there was a democratic structure in which they could uh, voice those demands. Does that make sense? Well, well, Black Lives Matter, they rebranded themselves some years ago. I used to be very critical of Black Lives Matter, and there was a lot of push, a lot of push, you know, from within the stuff, behind the scenes, being like, where are your demands, where are your demands? And I think like a, a year or two in, they came up with this, they rebranded as, I think, the Movement for Black Lives, and they have a website, you know, has all of these demands. But I think um, what we could, you know, and people are proud that they actually kind of got their house in order, but I mean, I you know, obviously what we see are kind of like these sporadic groups that just kind of pop up and they go, well, we're Black Lives Matter Seattle, we're Black Lives Matter Houston, right? That's, and, and I think that, that's kind of another question as far as how do you kind of organize you know, all the cats together? How do you like, <laughs> and how do we get um, some kind of like, you know, centralized working with like, you know, the lower level. Personally, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not supportive. I'm not supportive of representative democracy. I like the idea of a bureaucracy, you know, for the nation. However, it's already baked in that this bureaucracy, the national bureaucracy, we do away with these stupid national elections, but it's already baked in that they have to have constant, 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 constant interaction with community councils worker councils all around the country. You understand what I'm saying? Whereas the community councils, the worker councils are constantly get, you know, like, you know, this old Soviet program or what was the idealistic version, constantly working with the bureaucrats saying, this is what we want. This is what we've all agreed upon. And this is what we want. It's your job to do it. But instead what we do is we're constantly fighting over which politician get in there. You know what I mean? And then that politician, we have, you know, something that's kind of seen in the development world where we talk about elite capture. You know what I mean? Elite capture and, you know, the, we all know how this works with you know, all the billionaires and all the institutions. They MJ, I want to see I know, if we I'm can, talking too long. Yeah, no, well, I mean, there, you've raised a lot, and I want to make sure the things you have don't get lost. So <laughs> Seren wanted to, to respond to some of what you said. John had a chance to. Seren did not. Um, and so let's go to Seren, and then I have a question for our panel, maybe to move us towards a close. You, you know, my take is that uh, in terms of whether or not we should democratize our union, I, I think that certainly we can talk about that the relevance of that question with respect to building political power and influencing politics. But there are immediate practical reasons why workers join unions and stay connected to them. And, my, and those immediate practical reasons around class sizes, the overtime, all of these issues are negotiated within the union. And if you don't have a democratic union, you may need to democratize that union in order for it to be effective on those immediate issues. 
So I, I think that that's, that's mm -hmm. one important dimension to it. We have to democratize our unions so that they could serve us even in the narrow confines of a collective bargaining agreement in terms of the Fair Labor Standards Act, those kinds of issues. Those, those are valuable enough, and that is why workers are, or, are organizing to democratize their unions. However, the process of democratizing the union produces a culture of conflict and a culture of class struggle that I think has broader implications for democratizing other entities, including the political parties, and raising questions about the relationship between, you know, my SEIU local and the, the hundreds of millions of dollars it will give to, um, to the Democrats. So I, I think that that's really an important uh, uh, arena for struggle. Uh, and there's no necessary contradiction between that and direct action in the streets. By the way, having participated in many many protests in the streets recently, right, in this COVID period yeah, are uh, associated or going under the frame of Black Lives Matter. You don't see any kind of direct democracy. You don't see any kind of representative democracy in these, in these activities. They tend to be, um, uh, as, as, as much as the demands are legitimate and people are well-intentioned, they tend to be self-appointed groups um, appearing before the masses. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Saren. Yeah. I completely. Yeah. So, so MJ, can you just, it's, I know you have a lot more to say. No, uh, no, I've, I've kind of, you know, I, okay, I throw out okay. a lot out there for okay. people to kind so, of. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you raise an important question about prioritization for one thing, right? Uh, I mean, certainly even as we may be, I think a number of voices here agree on some of these questions, we need to think both and not either or on a lot of these things. We still, if you're in an organization or if you have scarce time and energy, there's always the question of what do you prioritize? And that's not something we're gonna, that, that's gonna, I mean, I think as Seren has pointed out, people are going to prioritize differently no matter what we or our organization says. And so in fact, I think moving away from an either or mentality and how we talk to each other is actually part of the democratic struggle we may be needing to wage to have some appreciation to people's different approaches, even as uh, we, we seek to try to move towards some kind of unity. Well, um, MJ, well, let's, uh, I wanna, okay, we okay. are coming up on two hours, and I wanna pitch okay, okay. A, a question to both Seren and John to help kind of maybe wrap us up as we, as we near two hours. And that is, I mean, returning to this moment, right? It's not only the 20th episode of Shelter and Solidarity, um, it is also the, the last day of the Democratic National Convention, uh, which you know people have various appraisals of. Uh, I know one thing, one moment that got my attention was AOC, in fact, endorsing Bernie Sanders for president amidst the, the kind of parade of Biden endorsements. Um, I just, John and Saren, what is your view of not just the convention, but of this, this immediate period that we have now till November? Um, you know, what the, based on the analysis that you share, and you have certainly different accents in your analysis between the two of you, but a lot of shared ground, what is your view of, of this immediate period we're in. And I know, John, do you think that this immediate period can be done in a way, can be approached in a way that helps to build that working Democratic caucus hypothesis? Or is that something that needs to return after the election? How does your analysis as, as laid out in the S&D article and elsewhere um, kind of reflect on this immediate moment of the next 70 odd days? And, and Seren, the same question to you plus any closing comments that you would like to leave us with? Uh, well, I don't know if my article addresses the next 70 days very directly, but in my, in my opinion, I think these next 70 days are very important. I think uh, with all his faults, we, we, we have to work hard to uh, basically defeat Trump and, uh, and tr you know, that Trump is an existential threat to the survival of humanity and to democracy, you know, the, the steps he's taken to basically legitimize nuclear war and make nuclear war more likely is, is extremely frightening. Uh, uh, I think the uh, concerned uh, Union of Concerned Scientists moved the clock as close to midnight as it's ever been. And I think that if he gets into power, if he gets elected again, He's totally going to dismantle all treaties uh, governing uh, uh, nuclear weapons, and we're going to see a proliferation of weapons around the world and uh, 
a great a much greater likelihood that you could have an accident or a war and then not addressing global warming is another existential threat and and uh in if trump got reelected we sh will see greater chaos and just more people dying from the pandemic so i'd say it's it's even though Biden has incredible faults, it's, that's not really the issue. The issue is we need to get Trump out of there. And I think if the left comes together and organizes towards that goal, we could be also organizing towards the goal of the day after Biden gets elected, we're hitting the streets and putting pressure on him to implement uh, progressive policies. And in the United States, there's a long history of you know, social change happening in the context of reluctant democratic presidents and, and active movements. And we can, in part of that, we could, I would, my fantasy would be the left thinking about organizing at a, a, you know, an institutional, something like the Working Democratic Caucus, where we could uh, develop an institution that would allow the working class to to uh set out its vision form its identity and better organize towards our our uh united goals thanks john seren you know i'm i think i'm very much on the same page as john i'd rather be fighting biden for not moving fast enough on climate change than fighting Trump who denies that climate change is happening. And, and along all the host of other issues, I think the same thing may be said. I'd like to choose my enemy and I, I choose Biden to be my enemy. And I, in order for him to be my enemy, he needs to be in power. And so for the next 70 days, even though I would love to be able to support Howie Hawkins, um, for, uh, who's the Green Party candidate, a person superior in all respects to Biden, I'm going to make sure that American working people have an opportunity to vote and, um, and that they can exercise that vote, uh, uh, hopefully for Biden as opposed to Trump. Um, that said, I think that the next 70 days requires us to defend the, the, the voting process, right? It means defending USPS, it means uh, setting up direct assemblies of working people to, to protect the vote uh, after the 2004 election, you had voter assemblies created in Ohio to prevent Bush from stealing that election, something he was able to do with the assistance of the Secretary of State. So we need to, in all these cities that are gonna be critical cities, battleground cities for the elections, right? Where they're gonna be trying to suppress the Latino and black vote. We need to be there, we need to be present organizing to defend the, the ballot. We're not there to defend Biden per se, but uh, we're there to defend the sovereignty of those voters. So there's a lot for us to do. As much as I'm gonna be biting my nails over the next 70 days, I'm also gonna be out there organizing uh, along many different fronts, yep. Yeah, I, I just wanna elaborate on something brief. Uh, one, one issue as far as voter rights that we really need to inform people about, since most people are going to be doing their votes on mail-in mail ballots, mail-in ballots are complicated. There's a lot of directions that people have to follow to mail, to fill in their ballot correctly. And they have to like, for example, they have to sign their name the way they signed their name when they registered to vote. And I don't know how you still remember that, the fact, you know, but anyways, it, we're going to have to really educate people on the, on filling out those ballots correctly because the we could lose the election based on ballots being spoiled. So, yeah, Florida writ large. John, a key, a key part of your article in S and D, which again I really highly recommend people read and continue to engage and respond to it in writing and perhaps back on this show. A key part of the article is about the threats to people's right to vote itself and the, and the barriers. And we didn't really get a chance to dive into that as much today, but I'm glad we're flagging it here at the end, especially in this mail-in ballot environment that many are, are going to be confined to. I do want to point out that a few weeks ago, we did have a good discussion of many of these issues 
with Medea Benjamin and Victor Wallace right here on Shelter and Solidarity. Some of you were here, some of you were not. I put that link in the chat box. Uh, we had our show on elections, the left, and the threats to democracy. And we did talk a lot with Victor Wallace, who was on the call earlier. Uh, about He talked a lot about these structural uh, barriers that we need to be taking on uh, if we're going to make this electoral uh, working class takeover possible, which, John, you're well aware. I think we're going to wrap up. Do you, uh, just before we go, I mean, any closing words? I feel like you both gave us a pretty good, clear closing word, but is there anything you'd like to leave us to? We've talked a lot about nuts and bolts. If there's anything on the inspirational side that you'd like to leave people um, we talked about your article is bringing together the pragmatic, concrete, and the uh, nuts and bolts and the big picture. John, is there anything you'd like to say to us about what is the world? You know, the, you know what is what is it that makes this fight so so worth uh, it? Well, I would just like to say, you know, we're living in the best of times and the worst of times, and we're living at a important conjuncture in in human history, and uh, it's in as far as hope goes, we're just going to need to keep on working and take a leap of faith and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, believe in the possibilities that humanity can create, uh, a just world. Thank you, John. You know, uh, I do think the left can learn a little something from the church in one respect. You need to give people symbolic reminders of of the world that you want to make even if it doesn't arrive all at once uh so that's one thing we hope shelter and solidarity does is to keep hope alive and keep people connected keep people engaged and even in these times where it's difficult to do so in in person so thank you john lawrence thank you saran mudliar uh thank you uh linda lou linda lou uh can thank some other people too once she unmutes Okay, I'd like to also thank uh, Tim Sheard, who is one of our producers, and Kira Moodliar, and also Joe Ramsey is a producer of ours. Um, and I'd also like to thank our sponsors in Quentro 5, Socialism and Democracy, uh, Hardball Press, and the Community Church of Boston. Great.